This song is called There's No Reason We Can't Fall in Love. I wrote it. It drifted around my place for a couple of months. I found it, rewrote it, and it turned into this. Days go by. Waking, looking in your eyes Many dreams I've seen Just like memories to me They are passed by Only for this moment There's no We're back with Minstrels on the Block. I am your guest host, Julian Hernandez, and your normal host is in the hot seat, Mr. Brian Mallard. Welcome back to segment two. Thank you very much. It feels kind of weird over here, yeah. but <laughs> I'm enjoying it. That's the point. <laughs> We're going to get some hard-hitting issues today, awesome. Mr. Mallard. Um, first of all, uh, you talked about a little bit about how you came to start doing music, your your apotheosis into our, into our fine community. Okay. Um, what is your What is your day-to-day... Songwriting lifestyle like probably not very glamorous. Um, I stay busy a lot, and uh, I write songs in several ways. I write songs uh, like take some examples. Uh, one of my earlier songs that people seem to like was "There's No Reason We Can't Fall in Love." I wrote that song, and I was like, "This is trash," and I just tossed it aside. And um, it drifted around my apartment for months and months and months. And uh, one day I was like, I need to write another song. And uh, so I, I just happened to stumble across this. And I was like looking at it. Like, yeah, this has got some potential. So I rewrote the song. Mm-hmm. And I saved like two lines out of the whole song. And just totally re- rewrote the song beyond that. And that was There's No Reason We Can't Fall In Love. And I'd like to say that I've heard it said that the best songs are not written. They're rewritten. Ah. Um, that is true and that is not true. Um, you can write 
there are some songs that are phenomenal that once they're written, they're written. And there are other songs like There's No Reason We Can't Fall in Love that really need to be rewritten. Um, my song, Let the Past Go, people know it as Oh Whoa. Oh. Um, I like that song. Thank you. It was rewritten. I sat down. Actually, that w- in that particular song, I had the music first. And I was like, oh, i got to get some words for this. And I sat down and wrote it like three times, rewrote it. And, and frequently when I write songs, I, I do rewrite songs. Let me, let me take that back. But I don't rewrite songs on paper. I rewrite songs generally during a performance. I can say, hey, this line sounds better, and I'll say that. And then that's what sticks, and that's the way I do it from now on. Well, the, uh, I understand there's a difference between uh, writing, uh, playing by yourself and playing in front of an audience. It's a very different emotional context. And yeah. so I was going to ask you, when does a song pop as an acceptable song? Well, you said the song floated around your apartment. At what point did you have an epiphany? What does a song have to say to you for you to want to publish it and make it a good, good song? Well, I've got uh, an album, a concept album, that I am... That my plans are to re, to to remaster, redo, because uh, you do your first album and then you later on you're like, ooh, that sucks. So you you, you want to do it again. In this case, uh, I've got some equipment that I didn't have then, but it's a concept album. It's called Luminous Woman, um, which is named after a song I wrote. Also, my studio is named after the song. But um, there was a, a time in my life after I got a divorce where I fell in love with this woman who was unobtainable. And there was a lot of emotion there. And, that's, and that, that actually was the beginning. I, I was able to shout out all my feelings through a microphone, put all my, all my uh, feelings into songs. And uh, so when you put feelings into a song, there, there's two different types of songs. There, there are songs that are therapeutic to you because you're, you're, you're putting your, it's therapy. There are other songs, that, fantasy songs that you write, and I've got some of those I've kind of gotten into, uh, just cool ideas you write a song yeah. about. But as far as when a song pops, it's like you write a song, and I've got songs that I've written that, yeah, that's not bad, album filler song. Mm-hmm. I've got other songs like, ooh, I'm really digging this. And not necessarily, like if a song, if a song really pops for you, doesn't necessarily mean it's going to pop for somebody else. In fact, there are songs that, that people have told me they really liked of mine, that I was like album filler. So do you? So do you keep? Do you keep more songs or trash more songs? I, I, for the most part, I keep more songs. Mm-hmm. And I, don't, I, you know, as a songwriter, I can't say how it is for for other people. But for me, a lot of my songs seem to have manifested themselves in my subconscious or in my mind before they were ever written. I'll have a tune going through my head and words. And for a while, I was going by if I kept if these lyrics kept coming back to mind, then I would write a song about it. Yeah. And uh, I've got a song called "Edge of Forever" that was similar to that. But uh, "Luminous Woman" was actually supposed to be a, a rock song, and it turned out to be a slow ballad. Ah. Uh, they don't always turn out the way you think they're going to. But um, the real test of a song is when you play it and how mm-hmm. people react. And I've got That's songs. a great moment, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's a great moment. <laughs> sometimes it's a great moment. Sometimes it's like, well, I guess this was an album filler. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that, uh, that brings me to my next question. Um, if you had to, which of your five senses would you sacrifice? Mm. I mean, as a musician, it may seem obvious, but everyone's answer is different. Well, it can't be speech. I'd rather not lose the eyesight because mm-hmm. of the chicks. Um, can't lose the hearing. No. Can't lose the taste. Hmm. I have to get back to you on that one. Yeah? Yeah. All right. I guess I have to lose the sixth sense. I didn't. The sixth sense. <laughs> lose your sixth sense. Just Brian Mallard, the possessor of a sixth sense. <laughs> but it's not as important as tasting stuff. So. Right. <laughs> um, so you, uh, you, you talked about your, so your process for songwriting and things. Um, do you ever collaborate with other people? As a, write songs together? As a rule, I don't simply for time because I, I'm, I, I stay pretty busy and I don't really have a lot of time. Mm-hmm. But um, I, when Brent Lindley was still in town, uh, he and I used to work together a lot and we would shoot little snippets of videos for him to put online. And uh, actually, that's where I learned a lot of my editing because uh, I shoot day trips now that I edit myself. And I have Brent to thank for that because oh, he nice. kind of, you know, through his projects, I kind of got schooled in editing. 
And uh, but he he and I collaborated on a couple of things. He'd say, "Oh, how about trying this?" You know, whatever, because uh, we we bounce ideas off each other. And there's a couple of songs, "Shadows of Your Mind." He he did had some you know uh, hand in. Um, and uh, my nephew uh, Robbie Wright, he, uh, he he came up with a music riff for a couple of my songs mm-hmm. that uh, I didn't actually. I only wrote the words for. But so usually my collaboration is happenstance. Yeah. So that's how that works. Well, speaking of collaboration, how did you get into, uh, into, I mean, you're obviously very active in sort of the sidelines of a lot of music. You're always at the open mics, taping people's performances. You're always uh, helping with things. You do the show. I mean, do, you, do you like all the periphery of music as much as music? or As a performer, and, and this, this is a tricky part, and this is a part that, that I've analyzed, you know, done some mental analyzation on. As to, to what was what I, my my absolute love was, and of course there's nothing like having a really good performance in front of a bunch <laughs> yeah. of people. But I also have a great love for editing, shooting, filmmaking, um, hosting open mics, and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a great love for all of that, and the way that I would like to try to make it is through my songs. Mm-hmm. Excellent. And still do the other stuff too. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we're, we're we're about to go to another one of your performances, but I did want to ask. Um, Who's a uh, who's a hero of yours? Who do you look up to? I guess my earliest hero would be my brother, mm-hmm. Walter. He uh, he was a tremendous influence in my life. Why? He was just he was a really great guy, very creative, uh, very kind, and uh, we just we had a, had a, a, a just an ironclad friendship. Yeah. What's his name? Walter. 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 B. This one goes out to Walter. This next performance from Brian Mallard. Rock on. Rock on. Lots of songs written about love during the summertime. This is the opposite. It's called Dance in the Winter Solstice. Despite the chill, it is hot. Despite the chill. 